All right, I'm going to get started. So good afternoon, everyone. My name is James Stewart. I'm. Uh, a, it's a pleasure for me to be here. Um, that's a picture of me uh, at, at, on my bike. Um, for many years, I was a cyclist. And uh, as you'll learn in my talk here, I'm a person living with multiple sclerosis, and my life was changed pretty dramatically because of it. Uh, I wanted to give you a little bit of background. So what I'm going to talk about is uh, about multiple sclerosis, and then also the mechanism of how they believe the disease of multiple sclerosis is working, what happens with it, uh, how I'm going to talk about disability and how the disease affects people. And then I'll get into some of the medicines that are used for treating MS. And then I'll talk a little bit about the advocacy that I do to help find a cure for MS. And then I'll finish up with a few interesting research projects that are using those stem cells that we saw just a few minutes ago. So my background is that up until the time I was 45, I had a very active career with a number of different things. I, I studied uh, at UC Davis and uh, studied fermentation science, which is the art of making wine. But I used that and worked at Genentech, which is a pharmaceutical company. And early in my career, I helped manufacture tissue plasminogen and activator, which is used to dissolve blood clots in the heart. So uh, one of the big ironies that I experienced in my life here is that as my life evolved, I ended up becoming a, a patient that uses product that is made by Genentech. Um, but in any case, uh, I had a great career um, and now it's about a quarter of my life that I've been living with multiple sclerosis. I was diagnosed in May 11, 2007. And since then I've been working with not really employed, but helping to do advocacy with the National Multiple Sclerosis Society and participating with Americans for Cures, which is an organization associated with CIRM, which is the California Institute for Regenerative Medicine. And because of that, I am serving on the UC Berkeley Stem Cell Research Oversight Committee as a patient advocate. So I'm able to look over research that uh, is geared towards curing not only multiple sclerosis, but a number of different diseases. And I wanted to clarify that you can see on this slide that I don't have, I'm not a doctor. Uh, I'm, I'm not a scientist per se. I have a little background in science, but um, I'm mostly a person living with multiple sclerosis. And what I'm going to share with you today is uh, really what I know about the disease from my personal experience. So I don't know if any of you may have experienced uh, or know somebody that has MS, but one of the things about multiple sclerosis is that it presents itself in many different ways uh, for many for different people, we're all different and we experience the disease in different ways. Um, but some of the common symptoms are that, in fact, one of the first sim symptom is a visual symptom uh, where oftentimes people get blurry vision commonly in one eye and it could be um, heat related, but you might also find difficulty just with, with seeing what you're looking at on a computer, for instance. Uh, the other common problem that people first experience is uh, what they call foot drop, where your toe just doesn't quite pick up as you're walking like it normally would. And people end up tripping or sliding on a gravelly surface and not realizing why that's happening. But it's just that your muscles aren't coordinating. And um, so you end up tripping and falling. Um, it could lead to uh, walking difficulties, but uh, as you see, some people might just experience depression or some numbness. Uh, some people, the first symptom, they experience numbness in their face. And uh, so it all depends on where the disease is affecting them. Um, primarily, multiple sclerosis is a disease of the central nervous system. It affects the brain and the spinal column. And uh, 
you know, so that's where the disease resides. And we'll get into more of that as we go along here. So it's, I have this point here, is any one of these or all of them, it could be many of them, many of these symptoms that people have. Uh, and it's really the doctor's uh, concern to figure out what's going on when a person experiences this and decides that they want to go to the doctor to figure out what's really happening. So one of the big things that also happens is uh, fatigue. Um, many people, one of their first symptoms is just that they don't quite feel as energetic as they used to be. And um, you can see the dialogue here where somebody's talking with a cyclist who's just really having a tough day. Um, and, uh, you know, it's what's what's wrong? And uh, it's my multiple sclerosis fatigue. And someone else is saying, well, maybe you're just tired. I, I get tired sometimes. And we all get tired. Uh, but uh, this guy responds, I'm tired, exhausted, really. But it's But it's more than that. And uh, his friend says, but you haven't done anything. He says, well, thank you. I know this, this, that's uh, just the frustrating part of that. Oops, I'm sorry. I've hidden my screen here. There we go. Uh, and he says, response, a nap is needed. Your eyes uh, are closing. And the guy responds, I'm not sleeping. My eyelids are just heavy. It's hard to hold up. And uh, the guy says, I understand. And he says, no, no, you really don't. Um, and I can really relate to this. The fatigue is something that is just really hard to describe because it'll hit you at any given day or any given hour of the day. Uh, and it's really almost um, it, just staggering in its effect. It really is, uh, it'll slow a person down quite dramatically. All right. So, um, Multiple sclerosis was first described by this fellow, Jean, Jean Martin Charcot, in 1868. And uh, he realized that, um, that it has something to do with, with heat. Um, and the, uh, the problem that most people experience with MS is that when their body gets warm, the nerve conduction doesn't happen as well as it normally would. And it causes that fatigue that, that I was just talking about. And um, they would test this in patients that they thought they would have, that they thought would had MS by asking them to sit in a warm bath. And if after 15 minutes in a warm bath, their legs were weak and they had difficulty moving them, then they would diagnose them with, with multiple sclerosis. Uh, then they described it as lesions disseminated in space and time. And really what that means is that you would have uh, an attack or uh, a lesion happening in one place of your brain or your spinal cord. And then a few months later, or even a year later, you would have another lesion that happens in another place in your brain that would affect a different part of your body. And um, because it's disseminated in space and time, then they would be clear that it was multiple sclerosis uh, symptoms that they were ex that you're experiencing. And now, nowadays, they use uh, a spinal tap or uh, an MRI picture of your brain to, to look for the inflammation that happens in the brain as a signal that you would have multiple sclerosis. And uh, because the MRI is a recent, more recent development in technology, uh, and it's becoming more widely used, more and more people are being diagnosed with MS. There were other criterias for diagnosing MS that, that over the years, and the more current one is this McDonald criteria that physicians use. And the McDonald criteria, really, it's the, the best way now to describe uh, the or diagnose the disease. And um, um, it because it presents differently from one patient to another, really what they're doing is trying to ascertain the uh, the difference um, in space and time. And they do that in, a, in this, there's a link here if anyone's interested. Um, it's a pretty complicated uh, process because 
they're looking at different parts of the body to see where the disease might be affecting them uh, to come up with a diagnosis. So there's what's considered four types of multiple sclerosis. Uh, the clinically isolated syndrome or the early stage of multiple sclerosis is where a person would have their first attack. And that's where they would have that first instance of inflammation in the brain and they would experience those symptoms that I was describing, you know, maybe a blurry vision if it's in the optic neuritis, uh, in the optic nerve of your eye. Um, and really what's happening with the clinically isolated syndrome in the past, up until just a few years ago, doctors would say, well, we can't really diagnose MS because we haven't had a second event in a different, in a different place in your body. So they would just describe it as a clinically isolated syndrome and they might treat it with some steroids, uh, but then they would let you go. And, um, you know, oftentimes the body is able to repair this damage. And so that symptom would go away uh, and things would be fine for a period of time. Um, but then it would rear its ugly head and come back and we would have uh, another event. And at that point, they would start to describe it as this recurring remitting MS where you have, um, you have um, an attack um, and then the issue goes away. And um, uh, I'll, I have more slides that'll share more information about these different versions of MS in the coming up. Then there's another version of MS that they describe as secondary progressive MS. This is where you would have uh, an attack, it would resolve, then you would have another attack, it would resolve, but you might have a third attack and it was resolved, but unfortunately the disability starts to increase and the ability, the recovery isn't quite as good as it would be in, in uh, recurring remitting MS. So the disability starts to add up and they describe it as secondary progressive MS. And the fourth type of MS is this primary progressive MS where uh, people experience uh, just a continual uh, degradation in, in ability uh, where they might have an attack uh, that doesn't quite resolve, but things just generally get worse over time. And um, so that's described as primary progressive MS. All of these are defined by lesions in the central nervous system. And right now uh, there's not really a clear understanding of what causes the lesions um, they have lots of theories about what causing ms but really they do not know the the actual cause and they're thinking that it may be related to stress or some infection um, and there could be uh, they've studied genetic predispositions and they've learned that there are 200 variants of genes that that increase the likelihood of having MS. So, um, so as I mentioned, there's really don't know what causes MS. Um, there, this is a picture, actually a self-portrait of my uh, my brain with arrows pointing to some lesions that developed for me, um, and you can see the highlighted uh, areas here. Those are the inflammation that's caused by something that crossed over the blood-brain barrier. And, um, you know, our brains are very protected areas of our body. Uh, the brains are covered by this, um, by the um, fluid the, that covers your, your brain and, and your spinal cord. And that's all protected by this blood-brain barrier. And um, the cerebral spinal fluid, you know, is, is really a clear liquid. It's, it doesn't have any blood in it. It, uh, but something crosses over that blood-brain barrier and gets through that, that cerebral spinal fluid and gets into the, the nervous uh, tissues that are really your axons and, and nerve cells that your brain is, is consisting of. So they're thinking that, you know, again, exposure to toxins might be a cause. We really don't know what the trigger is. And there's lots of research uh, going on right now about the gut microbiome connection, where um, they recently came up with the idea that this Clostridium perfringens it, toxin uh, is a bacteria that may be living in the gut of people or that is infecting 
in the gut of people living with multiple sclerosis. And, and that toxin apparently has uh, uh, fingerprints that look a lot like the myelin that coats the axons in the, in the nerve cells. And uh, so they're able to, that toxin is able to cross over the blood brain barrier and uh, cause uh, the if infection that may be happening in people. So, uh, and there's also some role of, um, you know, the B cells. Uh, with MS, the idea is that the body is an autoimmune disease and um, the B cells are crossing over this blood brain barrier to attack the, the, the whatever the infection is caused by, and that's causing this inflammation. Uh, and um, so they're thinking that possibly B cells are just randomly getting through the blood brain barrier and just starting to attack myelin, but they're not sure exactly why that happens. So that's where they describe it as B cell dysfunctionality. Um, and then the other part of our body that happens, this is normal, where we have oligodendrocytes that remyelinate our nerve cells, and that's a process that happens. So um, if there is damage, there's a process to fix it, and um, that maybe that process isn't working as well as it should be. Um, possibly the oligodendrocytes are being held back from remyelinating by astrocytes that are also cells that are in that area of our body. And there could be other T cells, uh, and T cells are part of our immune system, and they could be having a role of identifying the myelin that's coating the nerve as, as an invader, and um, possibly they're signaling to the B cells that there's something here that needs to be taken care of, and the B cells are honing in and doing the damage that they're doing. And uh, there could be also a role of microglia um, as as we're we're when we're born, we have just trillions of brain cells, and there's lots of connections that are made. And um, over the years that we're growing in our youth, uh, those brain connections are 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 trimmed, if you will. And microglia are doing that. They kind of uh, kind of snip areas of the brain that are not being used. So it kind of explains, for instance, why some people are able to, and when they're younger years, or it's much easier for them to learn a foreign language. Our uh, language areas of our brain are developing in that early years of our life. But uh, after the microglia have clipped those sections of the brain where if we're not using that foreign language, it says, well, we don't need this area of the brain. And um, then it goes on and um, saves it for other, other use. So it's an interesting process our bodies are capable of doing. So here's some multiple sclerosis interesting facts. There's over a million people in the United States living with MS, uh, and it affects women uh, three times more frequently than men. Um, so there's something going on with the female anatomy that is potentially influencing um, the disease. Um, uh, there's, I mentioned earlier, the MRI sensitivity is, is showing that there's, it's being used to find more people living with MS. So the, uh, the rate of MS has risen, but, um, possibly not, um, it's possibly just because we have the tools to help learn which people are affected by the disease. So I mentioned those four types of MS. But um, there's a, the European Committee of Treatment and Research in Multiple Sclerosis, ECTRIMS, they have proposed a new way of classifying MS. And they think that it's, um, you know, basically uh, one disease process that's happening, um, just showing itself in different ways in different people, depending on their body makeup. And then to further complicate things, uh, scientists at Tisch, uh, they're in New York, uh, they think that primary progressive MS is its own uh, disease, possibly immunoglobulin G driven, and uh, that could be why uh, people uh, with, with primary progressive MS um, have a more severe disease course. And each of these uh, different uh, exhibitions of the disease kind of lead to the need for 
a personalized uh, medicine to help people that uh, are affected by, by MS to be treated effectively for their own personal uh, symptoms. Most more recently, just in the last two years, there's been a lot of, of learnings about MS. And one of the more exciting uh, studies that was done, uh, and Science Magazine published the data about this, uh, was that they did a study in the military. Uh, people, when they join the military, they have to have their blood sampled to make sure that they're um, healthy. And so they're able to take blood samples from just thousands of people. And what they did is they studied those patients over the years, and they were able to uh, follow them. And some of those patients ended up with Epstein-Barr virus. And, uh, and then they followed, they continued to follow them. And uh, they learned that those people that did experience Epstein-Barr virus, many of them went on to develop MS. And so there, that study really found this link between Epstein-Barr virus and MS, which is a very important discovery. And the idea here um, is that the, um, you know, the Epstein-Barr virus is somehow your body is fighting it off and uh, it's somehow entering into the B cells. And part of that Epstein-Barr virus uh, RNA if you will, the ribonucleic acid is incorporated into the B cell. So um, that B cell then starts to look like uh, it has that um, Epstein-Barr virus in it. And um, that same um, protein is what's involved with the myelin. And so our body ends up becoming a little confused as to where what is the myelin and where's the Epstein-Barr virus. And, and it essentially starts to learn to attack the myelin because of the Epstein-Barr virus presence in the B cells. So that's kind of the theory. Um, so, and you can see that the medium time from the first EBV positive sample to MS onset was five years. So it took a while for the body to develop that sensitivity. And one of the things that they learned also uh, was this, this biomarker, uh, they call it neurofilament light chain, uh, is something that can be used to monitor this seroconversion uh, where um, they're able to see that, that Epstein-Barr virus is, is, uh, is infecting in the, in causing an, an infection or a reaction in the, uh, in the central nervous system. So as you see, this is a very recent study, uh, 13th of January, just last year. Uh, just, this is a slide that just kind of shows the epidemiological uh, dispersion of MS, and it's more happening in the northern and southern latitudes. So you can see in the red here, um, and then also down in New Zealand, where more people are at high risk. And the theory here is that possibly vitamin D or exposure to sun, sun, sunlight uh, or lack of that is um, is really causing our body to be more sensitive uh, to that infection. Um, people in the middle part, le the middle latitudes here don't experience MS as much for some reason, and they don't really understand why that is. So switching gears, I wanted to talk about some of the people that have MS. Um, here is a list of a lot of famous people that, that have MS. Uh, um, it's uh, one person that I'm particularly interested in uh, was Selma Blair. She, uh, many of you, she was recently on the cover of Vogue magazine, actually, uh, or one of the covers, I guess they have many covers. And uh, she was brave enough to do a stem cell study where she, her body was um, ablated of, of, of the immune system. And then they re-injected stem cells into her that they thought would help her. And uh, she claims that she was helped by that. But um, I, I have another slide later in this presentation that shows how that affected her. Um, but so she's a more, one of the more famous people that have lived with, that are living with multiple sclerosis. Um, and, um, you know, so a lot of people 
that are are famous are affected and and uh, otherwise some not so famous people as well. So this slide here is uh, a, a slide that shows some data that is really uh, my own personal experience with MS. Um, so I, you may have gathered by the earlier images, I was a cyclist when I was younger and I enjoyed cycling to a great degree. I live here in Sonoma County in Northern California and we just have a, a wonderful place uh, to, to ride bikes. Um, lots of hills and just beautiful vineyards. And uh, I really took advantage of that when I could. Um, and I used to do these century rides. So I would ride, century ride is where you're riding 100 miles. And I was able to do that. I, um, but, and then I also rode my bike to work. And uh, this graph here is a, really a graph of how many miles I rode in a given month. And so you can see, I was a really active cyclist. Uh, some months I would ride over 350 miles in, in one month. And um, uh, there were a few times where I experienced some issues that I was thinking maybe I was riding my bike too much. And this turned out to really be one of the first symptoms that I experienced with multiple sclerosis. Uh, this arrow here indicates where I was riding to work and um, and I would, uh, of course, when you're riding a bike, your body temperature heats up and I would get to work and I noticed two things. One, I would look at stop lights in the distance and out of one eye, I would see the red and green and, and yellow lights changing. But and out of my right eye, I would look for the red and the green and they were kind of gray. So the color perception wasn't right. And then by the time I got back to work, I would sit down, I'd take a shower and get it get over to my computer and uh, look at my my emails and I couldn't really read out of my right eye so well there was blurry and uh, so I went to the doctor and I said something's not right and they said well it's central serous retinopathy uh, and uh, which is a leaky retina and they said it just causes this blurry vision and it'll go away and sure enough it did um, uh, so you can see for about a year later uh, in, in the latter part of 2003, I also had, uh, I was cycling and I noticed my leg I was cycling up one of the hills uh, nearby and uh, I noticed my leg was tremoring in a funny way. It was just really shaky. And uh, so I thought something's not right. I just blamed it on cycling too much. And uh, so uh, then I got excited to do another century ride. That was this one over here. Um, but then uh, I noticed things were getting a little bit more uh, difficult, um, and um, I actually ended up changing my job location. So instead of riding to my workplace that was about 12 miles away, I started riding to a workplace that was about uh, seven miles away. And so that's where my riding distance started to diminish. And I ultimately ended up changing jobs at this point where I um, started working on the Boeing 787 air, aircraft with a company that supplied conduits for the landing gear. And it was about that time when things really got rough for me um, because I was experiencing this new job. It was a stressful change for me. And um, I started to experience some depression, maybe because of my job change. But um, but really what was going on, and I didn't know it at the time, was that I was living with multiple sclerosis. And at this point, um, I was diagnosed. And two days after I was diagnosed, I started the first treatment, which was an injection, a daily injection of an interferon that tightens the blood-brain barrier, uh, basically making it more difficult for B cells to get into the central nervous system. Um, and then I, uh, you know, continued to do some rides. I really thought that cycling would would help me feel better. Um, exercise is a is a recommendation for you know if uh, you want to maintain your body in a good way, um, it's good to exercise. And I really tried hard to do another century ride. This one here, I rode about fifty miles. I couldn't do the hundred. And um, and then uh, I was on this medicine for a long time. Uh, still experiencing difficulties with um, just my ability to get around. 
And my doctor look, realized that my disability was increasing even with that medicine. And they changed my medicine to this, where the moon is, and I started taking Copaxone, which was another injectable. Um, that drug is one that instead of tightening the blood brain barrier, it is uh, putting a, a, a myelin like protein in our in your body just everywhere. So it's a decoy. And uh, the idea is that your B cells will fight will go after that that um, myelin like protein that's injected in you and leave your uh, the nerve cells that are coated by myelin alone. And uh, so that's the idea of that medicine. But unfortunately, uh, they're about, they, uh, I, I, and I actually stopped working because of my disability started to really ramp up. Um, and actually, this is a good point for me to point out at the bottom of this slide, I'm showing the EDSS scores that I had. Um, I'll, there's another slide that I'll explain this a little bit further, but my EDSS scores were going from, from zero to one to two to three and all the way up to four here. After I stopped working, I uh, switched over to, guess what, a medicine that I didn't have to inject myself with. This was a pill, uh, Jelenia. And they, that was really hopeful because, boy, not having to inject yourself every day is a real treat. <laughs> Um, so, um, uh, but at, and at the same time, uh, I was, you know, really hopeful that that would make a difference in my life. And that's when I did the, uh, the last bike ride, uh, fundraiser with the MS association, um, uh, that, uh, you saw the picture of earlier of me cycling. And I was able to ride, uh, I lived near a park and I would, was able to ride for quite a while, um, just a 12 mile loop, if you will, um, that I did consistently every day thinking that that would really help me. And it did, uh, I think it really delayed any real further disability, um, but unfortunately it just got harder and harder for me. You can see this bottom graph here is the, the frequency of rides and uh, it my frequency went up. There was actually one year here that I rode every Monday, Wednesday, Friday, uh, for an entire year, um, the, that 12 miles. And um, it did help, but at the end here, towards the time when it was starting to rain in, in January of 2015, I, I realized that it was really more dangerous for me to, and I could injure myself pretty seriously. And coincidentally, so that's when I stopped riding. And um, coincidentally, that's when my doctor said, gee, this Jelenia is not working for you. I need you to start taking an infusion of this medicine called rituxan, and that's the medicine that that Genentech manufactures. So I'm going to move on off of that and uh, just talk a little bit more about um, the theory of what's happening to explain the MS progression. You can see that it really affected me in in my ability to to do things. Um, so they're thinking now, and this is just really recent thinking over the last two years, uh, is that the Epstein-Barr virus causes that immune response, um, the blood-brain barrier breakthrough, uh, it causes mitochondrial injury, there's these inflammatory in events that happen that activate the B-cell response, um, the microglial activation decreases the immunosuppression and causes cytokine production, which causes inflammation. And then um, the other thing that happens is these ion channels start to not work so well. And the ion channels are what's transmitting our nerve signals. And so those nerve signals are just not getting to where they need to be. And that would explain why when you're walking, the signal to lift your toe every step you take is just not happening and um, it just gets there a little bit too late and uh, so it's because of this ion channel uh, deficiency that's happening and then astrocytes might be in secreting cytokines and that's inhibiting the oligodendrocytes from remyelinating the cells and um, then there's other structural issues that are happening causing that inflammation to become more uh, more real, and um, 
And then the loss of myelin induces what this axonal degeneration where really the axons aren't working anymore. So I'm gonna show you a few slides here of, again, more pictures. We saw the uh, self-portrait of me, but here are more indicators of where the uh, gray matter is changed in the brain when that inflammation starts to happen. The idea is that the inflammation starts, then the demyelination starts to happen, and then it leads to this axonal loss that's indicated. These are nerve cells. And here's another picture of this uh, model that kind of explains what they think is happening. Um, this Epstein virus, bar virus infection, uh, getting into the B cells, and then this molecular mimicry that I described where the body starts to think that the myelin is part of this B cell infection that it has a desire to, to fix. And so it starts attacking the myelin. That's where the, these little uh, ridges here that are um, kind of oddly shaped are parts of the myelin that have been impacted by the B cells. And there was also a paper dis describing how primary progressive MS might be a little bit different. And um, they're, they're just realizing that there's a lot of differences with primary progressive MS, and they have a lot more to learn about it um, because there's something else going with primary progressive MS that's not clear uh, with the recurring remitting MS. This is a cartoon that the scientists uh, have come up with to kind of show the picture of what's happening. The yellow is a nerve cell. Um, the blue is an oligodendrocyte that's remyelinating or myelinating that nerve cell. Uh, the B cell sends out antigens. They start attacking that myelin. And um, the astrocytes have a role. You can see that up here. Uh, the blood-brain barrier is, is depicted in this part of it. And um, here's where the nerve signal transmission is just affected by the, by the uh, sodium and potassium uh, signaling that, that our nerve cells do. And um, this is more description of that, what I just showed you on, in the pictorial form. Um, and I highlighted this one section because it really explains that fatigue that happens in so many people with MS. And it's just that the energy requirements increase due to disruption of that, that myelin loop um, that's caused by the B cells attacking the myelin. And it's this sodium potassium pump failure that the, that sodium potassium pump is what enables us to send a nerve signal from one neuron to another. And uh, you can imagine that happens every second, millions of times every second as we're moving around. And uh, it's that disruption that's happening uh, where our body senses that it's being disrupted. And so it sends a little bit stronger of a signal to say, OK, lift up that foot when you're walking. Be sure to lift up that foot. And it gets very tiring. So I mentioned earlier about the expanded disability status scale. Um, and, and here's really what, they're, what the physicians are looking for. Um, the, EDSS steps of one through four, uh, it really shows people that are, it describes people that are able to walk fine, uh, but they're also seeing where, um, you know, the doctors are observing other, uh, other deficiencies. And so one of the things they might do is just ask you to close your eyes and, you know, um, touch your nose. Uh, so that would be a coordination issue that they're checking. Or another thing, they would ask you to close your eyes and stand on one foot. And uh, these are things that most normal, normally people can do these things. But with a person with MS, because they might have a little bit of loss of balance, uh, it shows that it's not quite working quite right. And uh, that's where they start to realize that, that something's not, not right. Um, and they start uh, associating an EDSS score with that. Unfortunately, the MS disability uh, in many people, it kind of continues on. So it starts out in this area here where everyone's able to walk just fine, but they're, they have the disease uh, and it slowly but surely affects them. And I showed that in that earlier slide with my cycling endeavors where the EDSS score would increase. And 
ultimately it got to the point where I was using a cane and that's about when I started to, when I stopped cycling. Um, and uh, unfortunately for me, it's gotten a little bit worse still after, even though I am taking medicines, uh, rituxan uh, medicine to, to uh, this is a disease modifying therapy that slows down this disease. I'm, I'm at a point where I need to use a walker and um, I'm trying to stay away from having to use a, a, a wheelchair uh, because, you know, if you, my thinking is if you, if you don't use it, you're going to lose it. So I try to keep walking, even though it's very difficult for me. And um, a little bit further on that EDSS score, this is what they're looking for and what I kind of just described. Um, so you can kind of guess um, I'm over here at about six and a half um, requiring, I, I need two walking aids, which means two canes really to, for me to walk uh, without, um, without uh, a walker. Um, and I'm trying to stay away from this seven where I would be in a wheelchair. Um, and unfortunately, it gets worse for, for many people. And uh, this is even with the um, disease-modifying therapies that, that we take. So I wanted to go a little bit further into the descriptions of those four types of MS, uh, just so that uh, we know a little bit more information about each of those symptoms. Um, I'm, the first one was clinically isolated syndrome. Uh, this is uh, where you would experience those, those problems that we've been talking about, uh, maybe a walking difficulty, or some people might have a bladder problem. All of a sudden, they have this urgency where they have to urinate, uh, or they might have a dizziness problem. All of these things are um, where you would have these symptoms lasting for at least 24 hours, and um, it's just one episode of this. And the, now that they have the MRI, they might show one area of myelin damage, and um, then they would see, um, you know, where there's more myelin damage. Uh, in the, if there's more than just one area, that would indicate that they're more developed or further along than this clinically isolated sy syndrome. Here's relapsing remitting MS. It shows where uh, you would have uh, a relapse, and then it would remit. So the relapses are where there's exacerbations, um, where you, you would have an, a problem. So maybe one is an eye problem, another one is uh, leg weakening, another one is numbness in the face. Um, and the idea here is that uh, because you are taking these medicines, um, these disease modifying therapies, the conditions are improving and it's kind of delaying uh, the worsening of it. Um, unfortunately, this could continue to get worse, and it develops into this secondary progressive MS. And this is marked by these frequent exacerbations where, um, uh, you know, just problems are happening more frequently and, um, you know, also steady progression of the symptoms. And then I mentioned primary progressive MS where things just slowly but surely get worse over time. You might have one attack or a, a, an issue with something else that's happening. and uh, But generally it's slow and steady progression with no remission periods. So it's not returning back to what it used to be like. It's just continually getting worse. And I talk about these relapses. Uh, when they happen, uh, they're generally what doctors will do is prescribe steroids and they slow down the inflammation and they make you feel pretty good about um, how you're feeling. So um, that reduces that inflammation. It kind of puts a halt to the inflammation, um, but, um, but it's, the disease is still happening in the background. And there's something they call pseudo exacerbations. And uh, this is where um, you would have relapses and that are related to heat or exercise or, or even illness that if your body temperature gets raised by a, by a fever, it really affects people with MS. Um, I mentioned there's no cure for MS and um, all these disease modifying therapies, they slow the progression of MS, um, but unfortunately it doesn't stop the disease. I wanted to show you a little bit more about the medicines for MS over the years, they um, they started out thinking that it was 
inflammation related to our diet. And in the 50s, they gave uh, suggested that people go on to the swank diet. And we're still seeing that diet is an important factor in, in helping um, people live with MS. Um, I mentioned I was on beta -seron. That was developed in 1993. So most of these medicines uh, have uh, are currently um, just recent developments. Rituximab, I mentioned I took that one, and also Copaxone. You can see that these are really recent developments. And um, some of these, the big thing here, all these were injections. And um, the big news, as I mentioned, when they came out with Jelenia, that was a big uh, treat for us that for her on these injections that suddenly we could have medicine that what didn't involve injections. Uh, and then they came up with the rituximab as an infusion, but they started realizing that uh, that infusions might help people uh, in, in, in with the disease. And they came up with some more um, medicines that are um, it, infusions. It was only in 2017 that they came up and approved uh, a medicine called Acrevis. This is also a Genentech product um, that is um, for primary progressive MS. Up until this time, there was no uh, medicine uh, or disease modifying therapy available for people with primary progressive MS. And uh, they're finding that this is uh, a B cell. They, they know it, it depletes B cells and uh, that's why it's working. It basically is um, you know, killing off a, a big part of your immune system that is really the part that's attacking the myelin and that's how it's working. All these other medicines uh, do the same kind of thing, depleting the B cells. Okay, I know I'm about 10 minutes to noon here. I'm gonna go quickly through a few slides. Um, there's, these are um, uh, more, more um, medicines that I wanted to share you, just the pricing of these medicines. Um, it's very expensive, these treatments. Uh, $111,000 for the, for the beta seron. This is an annual price. So people that live with MS have a huge burden. And, and it's, just, it's not just the disease modifying therapies, but it's also, um, you know, the, the medicines that are uh, prescribed to uh, treat the co-symptoms that happen with MS. So just giving you an idea of those. These are all those symptomatic medicines I just mentioned. So, um, you know, some people have depression, so they're having to get some Paxil or Cymbalta, um, you know, for fatigue, they might get Provigil or Ritalin. Uh, different medicines for different problems that they might also experience. So it's just not the uh, it's not just the disease modifying therapies they're needing to purchase. They're getting these other medicines as well. And um, you know, so my suggestion, if you do have MS or if you know anyone that does, please suggest that they take a disease modifying therapy. And uh, what about prevention? Um, you know, they're working on a vaccine against Epstein Barr virus and. The other uh, idea is to reduce stress. There's, there's a real thinking that stress is part of it. And vitamin D exposure, so go get some sun. <laughs> and, uh, uh, and then they're talking about the diets again. Uh, this is real recent that they came up with some suggestion to go on a keto, excuse me, a ketogenic diet, high in omega-3s, olive oil, avocado, nuts, all those good foods. And then the physical activity is still important, but they suggest doing yoga. Uh, massage is really helpful for people that experience spasticity. That's muscle tightening that happens um, with uh, because of the inability to relax the muscle. And uh, meditation is also really helpful for people. Um, okay, um, and then I just get, I'm getting towards the end here of my presentation, uh, but I want to mention the importance of advocacy. Um, I worked with the I do advocacy with the National Multiple Sclerosis Society really to get funding for, uh, for MS uh, research. And then also with Americans for Cures, this is the, the California Institute for Regenerative Medicine. Uh, here in, here we, in California, we, we uh, voters approved at five and a half billion for stem cell research. And I was part of that uh, effort to get that, get that bill passed. Um, so, uh, and this is just showing some of the latest theories um, that they're looking at. There's a lot of talk about this Bruton's kinase inhibitors. 
Uh, they're still working on more, more treatments. Um, a lot of them are due to National Institute of Health funding. In fact, almost all the therapies that I was talking about earlier are for, resulting from, uh, from that. There's also funding for research that's done by the National Multiple Sclerosis Society. Uh, they're doing this, um, uh, this project that is uh, essentially looking for cures um, that are, uh, they're basically trying to coordinate all the researchers to find cures. This is some funding, this is, shows you what the CIRM funding uh, did, uh, over, over $11 million funding for, for research at various org institutions uh, related to multiple sclerosis. And, um, oops, I didn't mean to click on that. I'm not sure how that happened. Okay, let's do that. Uh, and then there's from the National Multiple Sclerosis, this is the Pathways to the Cures. There's just a whole bunch of research that's happening with stem cells actually, as well as just other projects. Um, so just going through these quickly, you can see there's just lots of research happening all over the United States. And some of these uh, are coming up with some, this is a recent study with stem cell reports that came up with this. They're learning that fractaline enhances oligodendrocyte regeneration and remyelination. So these are things that really could help people living with MS. And you can see there's a lot of projects, 87 of them, just looking at how do we reverse the symptoms and promote wellness. And that's really the issue for people with MS. Uh, all those disease modifying therapies, they slow down the disease, but they don't repair any of the damage that's happened. And that's really where this research is, is focused, is to try and make it so that our bodies get back to normal. I mentioned Selma Blair. Uh, this is a picture after she had her immune system ablated, really down, you know, um, caused her some challenges. And, uh, but she says it helped her. Um, and most promising with stem cell therapy is that they have this idea of doing uh, mesenchymal stem cell derived neuroprogenitors. The idea is to inject these into the um, into the the space in the in the um, inter in the spinal canal uh, where people would essentially have these um, stem cells injected in their spinal canal and they find that that's really helpful for people. So this is where the latest and greatest um, research is happening. And there's some great tools for scientists to use to discover more cures, and that's exciting for us as well. Um, so there is hope for people living with MS. If, if uh, you're one of those people, just keep in mind that they're doing a lot of work um, and they're getting really a lot closer to finding a cure for, for MS. There's a study in this ATA 188 that's pretty promising. Um, we'll, we'll see what happens. I'm showing some citations here just to show where I got that information. And I also want to point out that there's multiple sclerosis support organizations uh, around the country and around the world, really, that help people living with MS. And um, World MS Day is coming up on May 30th. So uh, please, um, please note that. and. Um, support it in any way that you can. Um, so it's an exciting time of the year. So let me stop here and see if there's any questions in the chat. Uh, I know we're running a little short on time, but hopefully we can, I can look at a few questions and, and uh, get some responses. Okay, let me, I'll leave this uh, cartoon up there while you're um, looking at the questions. Okay, so, All right. Hi there, Nick. I see that you had a point there. Um, is MS affected more predominantly from environmental factors or genetic? So yeah, uh, Lucina, that's a really great question. And this really what they're trying to figure out. Um, we don't think that there's a genetic component because people that it's not true that people that have MS are gonna have children that have MS. So it's not entirely a genetic disease, but um, I know of people who, who have two people living with MS in their family. 
So something's going on and it could be genetic. Um, and they're also thinking, and I showed you in that slide, that there is a, a genetic component that they think um, might be explaining the, the sensitivity um, that um, leads to susceptibility for environmental influences that could be the cause of MS. Um, so I uh, hopefully I've, I've answered that one. And then, oh, you have more comments here. Um, I believe that T cells, uh, let me observe, you guys can read it as well. Um, So, okay, this is interesting. Um, uh, I've heard a lot about the theory of T cells being a big part of MS and the cause of MS. Um, and there is a company that is working on that, Atara Therapeutics, I mentioned, um, they, uh, that ATA-188. And the idea is that they can use the T cells to, um, to uh, essentially fix the B cells that are infected, uh, these antigen presenting cells. Um, so this is a really great question. There's lots of uh, technical details here that um, maybe I can uh, follow up on this offline. All right, are there any other questions? Well, I uh, I suppose there's not, and uh, we're right at the end of the hour here, so I think our timing worked out pretty well. Uh, I just want to thank you. Um, I also want to thank Shay and Shab for setting this up. It's been a real pleasure to share my MS journey with you, and uh, I um, am hopeful that we find a cure for MS real soon so that I can get back on my bike and uh, get out there and ride again. And I wish you all the best and uh, success in your endeavors to pursue your careers in, in nursing and doing what you're all doing. So thank you very much and have a great rest of your afternoon.